So I'd like to ask you to turn in your Bibles to Isaiah chapter 7. Isaiah 7. While you're turning there, I um, want to kind of give a little background of, of where we're going and, and why we're going to Isaiah this morning. Um, I've been doing this Foundations of Faith series. I, I, think, I've, I think there's nine messages now so far, um, and uh, this would be the 10th, I believe. And it's time to look at the, the, the doctrine of Christology, the doctrine of Christology, the, the doctrine of Jesus Christ. And it fits very well with the fact that we are getting ready to celebrate Christmas. And for this series, I have been teaching um, systematic theology. And if you'll remember way back at the introduction, we talked about how how God unveils, how he unfolds his, his truth about himself and unfolds his plan to us through his word, how it was given progressively starting with the book of Genesis and, and, and he completed his revelation to us with the book of Revelation. And, and we, we kind of have been looking at this in a progression, but I've been teaching it in a systematic way, looking at one doctrine and taking passages from all over the scriptures to, to teach, to boil it down, to teach these basic doctrines. But I, I, I couldn't do it this time. I felt like because it's Christmas and because we're talking about Jesus, I wanted to stay more focused on one passage of scripture, I wanted it to be a little more organic this morning, right from the scriptures, as we look at some of the key foundational truths about Jesus. Now, my plan is to ultimately give you a bulletin handout with, with the, the, the systematic aspect of things laid out nice and neat and in order, but I want you to see it this morning, how God already was unfolding the truth about Jesus Christ 700 years before Jesus was born. How he was unfolding some specific truths about Jesus back then. That we don't have to, to just find those truths in the New Testament, even though Paul may lay them out in a way that's a little more clear to our, our Western analytical way of looking at things, but they were already taught in the scriptures in the Old Testament that the nation of Israel could already know these truths about their Messiah before he ever arrived. And so I want to take you back in time and back in our scriptures to the prophet Isaiah. And we're going to look at, um, we're going to look at uh, Christology through the lens of Isaiah. And um, in Isaiah, this is the theme of the book. That the Holy One of Israel will judge, will restore, and will save his people. Now, the book of Isaiah was written to Jews. They were the original audience. And it was written in a time when they were not following God's law. We spent time in Sunday school today, quite a bit of time, looking at the covenants that God gave to Israel. Not just the the Abrahamic covenant, but the, the land covenant, the, the covenant of Moses that came with all kinds of promises if they would obey, but also curses if they disobeyed. And Israel had been living in disobedience and they did not want to turn wholeheartedly back to God. And he was warning them of the judgment to come. But he doesn't give warnings without hope. First of all, warnings are often given. Now there's a time where Israel reaches the point of no return, but warnings are often given as a statement of hope, like, hey, turn back now and you can be restored. But even when the warnings are, it's too late, here's the judgment that's coming, there's promise of future restoration. And that's what we see throughout the book of Isaiah. And so um, this is, is really about hope for people in darkness, the book of Isaiah. And to give you a little background um, in specific, um, Israel had begun worshiping false gods, and they had been practicing all kinds of evil, evils that God had specifically warned them against. Um, they had adopted the immoral worship practices of the pagans, which included all kinds of, of um, 
excess and drunkenness and sexual immorality and even wickedness to this extent that they were offering babies to Malak. They were sacrificing their children. It's horrible to think of a nation doing that, isn't it? They were oppressing each other. It was a terrible place to live. They would cheat each other. They, the, the, if you were of the weaker class, of the poor class, um, one of the reasons God so often talks about true religion showing compassion and justice to the widows and the orphans is because they are often the first to get oppressed when wickedness starts to rule the land. And that was happening in Israel. Their leaders, the national leaders, the king. And, and other leaders were making poor choices and were making unholy alliances with other nations in an effort to try to survive a very scary political landscape. And everyone, it seemed, was plugging their ears to God, plugging their ears to the words that he already had given them, plugging their ears to the prophets he had sent to speak to them. And so he began to chasten them. And the pain that they were feeling from outside forces and even the natural consequences of their behavior um, was, you would think, you would think it would drive them to God. And, And it was his chastening to do just that, but they were stubborn. And we have to be careful how much we point fingers at them, right? Because sometimes that's true about us as well. That as times get harder, when we should be turning to God, we turn away from him. Now, I want to give you a glimpse of the political landscape. And um, I'm always at a dilemma because I know that uh, no matter how, uh, if if I zoom in so it's big so you can see it, then you only can see a little piece at a time. And I just want you to see the big picture, and I'll, I'll read off what you can't probably read from too far of a distance. And you have a Bible, a map like this in your Bible, there's a good chance in the back. But here is the nation of Israel, right? That, that New Jersey-sized and almost shaped uh, nation of Israel right here. And this is Jerusalem down here. This little body of water is the Dead Sea. Up here is the Sea of Galilee. And the city of Jerusalem is, is here to the southern half of the nation of Israel. And that's usually designated as Judah. Or because um, the biggest tribe of the south was, was Judah. In fact, it was uh, half the, you know, the, the southern tribes. It was just, um, they were isolated. They often lived at at war with their their brothers to the north, the ten tribes to the north. So you have the two southern tribes called Judah and the ten northern tribes, sometimes identified by the term Samaria because the city that became their their capital city to the north. So so that's... uh, I'm sorry, I hit the wrong button. So that's... that's, uh, This is the nation of Israel here. Down here is, a, is the world power, Egypt. Egypt is a powerful nation, and, and it has been off and on all through history. So there's Egypt, the Red Sea's down here, the Nile River there. This, of course, is the Mediterranean Sea, and if I had zoomed out further, you'd see Italy over here to the, to the left, your left. North of Israel is the region that was known as Syria, their capital being Damascus. This right here, this big area here is all desert, the Arabian Desert, and uh, not um, very inhabitable, not very hospitable, and if you were a traveler in the ancient world, you did not go straight from Babylon to Jerusalem, you usually went around the desert. Um, Up here is the region known as Assyria. That was a big threat in the days of Isaiah. They were one of the superpowers. But there was also this developing power down here, Babylon. And the city of Babylon is right there. The problem with the nation of Israel is they are on the highway for anybody that wants to go from Egypt up to Syria or even over to Assyria. And if Assyria wants to conquer Egypt, guess who they run over first? the nation of Israel. That would be how they would move their army and and would come right down. So 
it, the reason I give you that little geography lesson is because when we read in Isaiah 7 about these powers, you need to understand um, Israel is living in great fear at this time. They're living in great fear. Not only is the king of Judah at war with his brother to the north, his, his, it's like a civil war, if you would, but, but they also have joined forces with Syria above them. So you have Syria and the northern tribes of Israel duking it out with, Judea, with Judah to the south, and, um, and the king of Judah gets it into his head that maybe he should try to get us, Syria, to help him out because they have mutual enemies. So with that in mind, let me start reading um, Isaiah chapter 7. Now it came to pass in the days of Ahaz, the son of Jotham, the son of Uzziah, king of Judah, that Rezin, king of Syria, and Pekah, the son of Remaliah, king of Israel, the northern tribes of Israel, went up to Jerusalem to make war against it, but they could not prevail against it. So it was told to the house of David, saying, Syria's forces are deployed in Ephraim. So his heart and the heart of his people were moved as the trees of the woods are moved with the wind. Then the Lord said to Isaiah, Go now to meet Ahaz, you and Shirar Jashub, your son, at the end of the aqueduct from the upper pool on the highway to the fuller's field, and say to him, Take heed and be quiet. Do not fear or be faint-hearted for these two stubs of smoking firebrands, for the fierce anger of Rezin and Syria, and the son of Remaliah, because of Syria, Ephraim, and the son of Remaliah have plotted evil against you, saying, Let's go up against Judah and trouble it, and let's make a gap in its wall for ourselves, and set a king over them, the son of Tabal. All right, so Ahaz is the king of Judah, and he is out looking at the aqueduct. It, it may be that he's, that's how they get water. His city's under siege. It's probably kind of a tactical, I mean, he's like assessing how long can we hold out? Are we going to survive? And he's scared about what's going to happen because he's got Syria and the northern tribes coming down on him. And... Um, and God says, you need to go speak to the house of David. Now, there is a reason for every word God put in the Bible. Verse 2, it says it was told to the house of David. In other words, it was told to the palace of in Jerusalem. It was told to the leaders of the nation of Judah. It was told to Ahaz and all his rulers that the northern tribes in Syria are attacking them. But I think God is trying to point something out when he doesn't say Ahaz, he says the house of David. I think it's a reminder that this is, that, that, that they're all connected to something bigger. That God made all these promises to David that his house will stand forever and that he will always have a ruler. That Ahaz is not to just think of himself as this lonely king all by himself, but he's part of a royal line that, that God has been working through and God has made big promises to. And the nation of Israel is not his nation to rule, it's God's nation. And they are God's people. Also, it says that the whole people were moved as the trees of the woods are moved by the wind. In other words, they, they're all scared. They're all shaken. Not just the king, but the whole nation. And so God says to Isaiah, go speak to Ahaz. I'll tell you where he is. Go meet him and go talk to him. And tell him, don't worry about those smolding embers. Those, those sticks that are about burned out. They're, they, they, were, they were the firebrand, it might say. And the word firebrand could be as simple as a little stick you use to light a fire with. Or it could mean a torch. And he's basically saying they're all spent. They're all burned up. They're just smoldering. They're, they're at the end of their life. Don't worry about them. Verse 7, thus says the Lord God, it shall not stand, nor shall it come to pass. Their plans aren't going to survive. For the head of Syria is Damascus. The head of Damascus is Rezin. Within 65 years, Ephraim will be broken so that it will not be a people. The head of Ephraim is Samaria. The head of Samaria is Remaliah's son. If you will not believe, surely you shall not be established. 
I think God is reminding Ahaz again. It's that a king, a king is, is, is not a power unto himself. He, he's part of something bigger. And God says, I know the ends of those that are attacking you. You need to believe me, Ahaz. But Ahaz has not been believing God. Ahaz has rejected God. And God is, in an act of mercy, kind of grabbing him and shaking him a little bit and says, look at me, Ahaz. I want to help you. And to prove it, he says, ask a sign for yourself from the Lord your God. Ask it either in the depth or the height above. God says, Ahaz, I want to prove to you I can help you. And I have a plan for you. So just ask me any sign you want and I'll show it to you so that you know I'll help you. And this is not without biblical precedent, right? Like we had Gideon. Do you remember Gideon? He put his what out? A saying that that has long outlived Gideon. He put out a fleece. And God made and, and God made the dew fall on the leaf, the fleece, and not the rock. And then Ahaz, uh, Gideon thought, uh, that, that maybe wasn't very clever. We sh- it should be the other way around. That would be harder. And he did it again, and God, God was, was patient with him and did a different sign. And, and Gideon was very timid, and he kept asking God for these signs, and God gave them to him to help build his confidence. So God is wanting to do that to Ahaz, and look what Ahaz does. I will not ask, nor will I test the Lord. He's trying to sound pious, like God. I remember one time you used the word test in a negative sense when Israel tested you, and I don't want to test you. But God just told him to ask for a sign. You should listen to God when he tells you something. And, uh, And God was a little upset. And in verse 13, he says, Hear now, O house of David. Notice he doesn't call him Ahaz. calls him house of David. Again, connecting them to something bigger and greater. Is it a small thing for you to weary men? But you're weary in God. Therefore, the Lord himself will give you a sign. Behold, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son and shall call his name Emmanuel. Curds and honey he shall eat that he may know how to refuse the evil and choose the good. For before the child shall know how to refuse the evil and choose the good, the land that you dread will be forsaken by both her kings. The Lord will bring the king of Assyria upon you and your people and your father's house days that have not come since the day that Ephraim departed from Judah. And it shall come to pass in that day that the Lord will whistle for the fly that is in the farthest parts of the rivers of Egypt. That's down here. And he's going to whistle for the bee that's in the, north, the farthest parts of Assyria, that's way up to the north, and they will come and all of them will rest in the desolate valleys and the cliffs and the rocks and on all thorns and on all pastures. And in the same day, the Lord will shave with a hired razor with those from beyond the river, with the king of Assyria, the head and the hair of the legs, and I will also remove the beard. And it shall be in that day that a man will keep alive a young cow and two sheep. So it shall be from the abundance of milk they give that he'll eat curds for curds and honey. Everyone will eat who's left in the land. And it shall happen in that day that wherever there come, could be a thousand vines worth a thousand shekels of silver, it will be briars and thorns. With arrows and bows, men will come there because all the land will become briars and thorns. And to any hill which could be dug with the hoe, you will not go there for fear of the briars and thorns, but it will become a range for oxen and a place for sheep to roam. He goes on and he is telling him, you know what? You didn't trust in me, Ahaz, so all your worst fears are going to come true. All your worst political fears are going to happen. You're going to get crushed. And you think that that Israel and Syria were your problem, Assyria is going to just come and plow right through everybody. They're going to wipe out the north. And just so you know, what happened in the future is Assyria came down all the way down, wiped out the northern tribes and decimated the country and took them away captive. They didn't just want to place them under tribute. They actually hauled most of them away and they wanted to assimilate them into Assyrian culture. The only thing that kept Assyria, first of all, God showed grace through Hezekiah. And he stopped Assyria before they took out Jerusalem. But after King Hezekiah, there there came more wicked kings. 
And by then, the Nebuchadnezzar of Babylon had become the reigning world power. And he absorbed the Assyrian Empire, and he came and took Jerusalem. And that's, that's what leads to the story of Daniel, which would be in the future from where we are now. But, I, but, but do you see that this, um, uh, this prophecy of Emmanuel was actually given as part of a judgment? It was the hope of restoration given before the judgment was declared. And basically it says there'll be a deliverer because you're going to need a deliverer. You don't trust me now. You'll have to experience my deliverance later. But in so doing, in so doing, God gives a prophecy that goes much greater, much bigger, and much farther than 8th century B.C. Israel. And so God sends Isaiah to encourage Ahaz. Don't turn to foreign nations for help. Turn to God. Ahaz refuses to turn to God. And, um, and, it, and it seems that, let me just be honest with you, scholars have been scratching their head how to fully understand Isaiah 7 for centuries. Because God makes it, as prophecy often is, a little bit vague, a little bit of a riddle. There is a clear lesson to learn, but sometimes the details are a little hazy until God clarifies them later on. We know, we know that Emmanuel is the Messiah being talked about, but it seems that there may have been an actual child born named Emmanuel in Ahaz's day as a sign, as a reminder that you disobeyed God, you didn't, you didn't trust him, you doubted him. And the judgment that came was because you didn't listen to God's word that was delivered to you by Isaiah. So here's Isaiah 7:14. Therefore, the Lord himself will give you a sign. Behold, the virgin will conceive and bear a son and shall call his name Emmanuel. Well, we read in Matthew that same verse quoted as a prophecy of our Messiah. And that makes sense because the word Emmanuel means God with us. God with us. Well, because of Ahaz's rejection, um, this, this sign of judgment is also a sign of hope and judgment would come in the form of foreign invasion, but hope comes in the future in the form of Emmanuel, God with us. Well, God keeps speaking hope. He doesn't stop there. Um, he keeps speaking hope into chapter 8 and into chapter 9. Not only is that important for a nation that needs hope, but it's also important for us to see how God is unfolding his plan. Now let me just show you the timeline of what happened if you're interested in that. Um, Uzziah dies in 742 B.C. Jotham dies and Ahaz became king in 735. And in 722, um, after he's been king for just 13 years, that's when Assyria conquers the northern tribes of Israel. Then Ahaz dies and Hezekiah becomes king in 715. And then Sennacherib invades Judah in 701 B.C. But that's when, when God miraculously intervenes and keeps him from taking over Jerusalem. So we have this wonderful promise that is a great verse to memorize that God is going to send a child through a virgin and his name is called Emmanuel. To help you fully appreciate all of this, let me just give you a big picture snapshot of biblical history. Because I, I like big pictures. Some of you don't care about them. But some people do. So for those of you that are like me, um, I want to make sure you understand biblical history a little bit. We have creation, right? Begins the book of Genesis 1, the creation account. And then we have Abraham, and he's the beginning of the nation of Israel. And we learn about him in Genesis 12, and we follow his story all the way through, almost to the end of the book of Genesis. And then we jump ahead in time. Isaiah, his ministry is taking place... Um, his ministry is taking place in 700, 
hundred, the seven hundreds BC. So, so 700 years before Jesus is born. And most scholars today agree from evidence we've gathered that, uh, uh, I forget the guy's name, that's, that gave us, you know, the calendar of B.C. and A.D. Um, basically, he was off a little bit. Jesus was probably born on 4 B.C., not, not 1 A.D. But um, that's why that, that date is up there. But Isaiah is forecast, he's predicting through the revelation of God 700 years in advance of Jesus' birth. And I want to make sure you understand that, that everything we're going to look at are teachings about Jesus 700 years before he was born as a baby. So the promised Messiah, we, I want you to turn with me now to chapter 9. Isaiah chapter 9. And this well-known verse, you might see it on a Christmas card this year. For unto us... A child is born, unto us a son is given. And the government will be on his shoulder, and his name will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. Now I want to pause, and I want to ask you to go back to verse 1. Because I want you to see that that verse of the child being born is a development of what Isaiah delivered to Ahaz a little while earlier. In verse 1 of Isaiah 9, it says, Nevertheless, the gloom will not be upon her who is distressed, as when at first he lightly esteemed the land of Zebulon and the land of Naphtali, and afterward more heavily oppressed her by the way of the sea beyond the Jordan in Galilee of the Gentiles. First of all, that should sound familiar because it's quoted in the, in the Gospels. But second of all, I want you to realize that what he's talking about there is he's talking about the northern tribes way up there at the Sea of Galilee that got crushed by Assyria in that judgment we just learned about. They were the first ones to get crushed, and they are the first ones that get to see the light. Because where was Jesus born? I'm sorry, Jesus was born in Bethlehem, but where did he grow up? Where is he from? Nazareth is his hometown. Remember in the Gospels, one of the people asked when, when, when the disciples were telling their friends, and one, the question was asked, can anything good come out of Nazareth? It was a backwoods town up in a backwoods country. And that is the part of, of Israel that got run over first by, Israel, by Assyria, but it's where Jesus began to teach and to talk. The miracle at Cana, the, uh, and, and then the fishermen that Jesus called, all fishermen from the Sea of Galilee, it says in verse 2, the people who walked in darkness have seen a great light. Those who dwell in the land of the shadow of death, upon them a light has shined. You have multiplied the nation and increased its joy. They rejoice before you according to the joy of harvest, as men rejoice when they divide the spoil. For you have broken the yoke of his burden and the staff of his shoulder, the rod of his oppressor, as in the day of Midian. For every warrior's sandal from the noisy battle and the garments rolled in blood will be used for burning and fuel of fire. For unto us a child is born. Here's the promise. The nations that were in darkness, the countryside that's grown up with thorns, it's going to be restored because the Messiah to come. And he's going to come and he's going to multiply their joy and they're going to rejoice like at the time when there's a great harvest or the time when you've won a big war and there's a great spoil. And he's going to push off all the oppressors and all the, all, the, all the garments of war and all the filth and the waste from the enemy that's been struck down. It's all going to just be burned up because, because Messiah is coming. And let's zoom in on this for a minute and let's look at what can we find out about the Messiah from Isaiah. First of all, um, we see that his name, Emmanuel, means that he's going to be God come in the flesh. And that's emphasized here in verse 6. For unto us a child is what? He is born. 
He doesn't miraculously appear. There's not going to be a lightning bolt. And there's Jesus laying on the ground and he stands up and he starts walking around. No, he's going to be born. And then it gets specific. It's not just any child. It is a male or female. A son is born. Now, that's not just important to know the difference between male and female, but who takes the throne of his father? The daughter or the son? It's the son, right? The the son is the one who becomes the ruler. And so, unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given. A son born to a woman. It's God with us. The word incarnate, maybe you hear that root word carne, um, and and the idea of of flesh. It is God in flesh. God taking on flesh. Now, when you, when you read earlier, um, we know that God, it says way back in, in, in the, the beginning of the Old Testament that, that God is, um, you know, he, he's not been seen by man. And so when God takes human form, that, that is a big deal. For God, the, the great God who's above his creation, who God who is spirit, takes on flesh. Unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given. There's emphasis on the birth, on it being a son, that he goes through the process of of being born. It is God incarnate, God with us, Emmanuel. Second, it says he'll be a ruler. It says, and the government will be upon his shoulder. He's going to be a ruler. Imagine how happy those who were righteous, the the righteous few in Israel, in the land of Judah, who have been looking at the decisions their king Ahaz has been making. They have been seeking God, and they can't understand why their king won't seek God. And rather, he wants to make alliances with these untrustworthy nations, who ultimately Assyria is one of the people he wanted to make alliance with. And they get run over by Assyria. Um, and and they, they just crave that he would turn to God. And it says, someday God will be the ruler. God will be the ruler. The government will be on his shoulder, and his name will be called Wonderful Counselor. Now, there, the, the, people debate on, is it Wonderful, comma, Counselor? But, but it may be better to understand it that he will be the Wonderful Counselor. The idea of Wonderful is being singular, being, super, being, being beyond what is ordinary. Um, not your regular counselor, but, but a, a, a someone above and beyond that. The Wonderful Counselor. He'll be, he will provide supernatural guidance. Um, He is God, and therefore, we need to to pause and think about this for a moment. It says he is the everlasting father. He's the mighty God, the everlasting father. The mighty God, the everlasting father. Is there any doubt that this son that's going to be born is deity? Could, could the Bible be any more clear? He is the mighty God, the everlasting Father, the Father who, has, who, who exists forever. And therefore, as God, as the possessor of God's attributes, he, um, I mean, as God himself, he possesses all of God's attributes. So if you go back to our study of theology proper, of God and, and the fact that God is wise and God is good and that God is, is unchanging and God is all-powerful, all-knowing, everywhere present, this is Jesus. He is full deity. It goes on to say, of the increase of his government and peace, there will be no end. His, his, his government will know no boundaries. Um, there we go. Get the right uh, slide. Somehow I have multiple. Sorry about that. It says he's going to bring peace, something a world craves. The world has always craved. Something that, that people, maybe in our day and age, maybe, maybe generations that are younger, Know that more. There are the generations that went through World War I and World War II and the generation that's gone through Vietnam and, and, and they crave peace. And then there were, you know, those of us who were born into a world that, that 
didn't know about world wars that much. We studied them in history. We knew people who were veterans of, of Vietnam, Korea, maybe World War II. But we didn't experience that until September 11th. We got a little taste of what it was like to feel that we, our peaceful existence, could be disrupted. And now we live in a day and age where, where, where the, the young people of our nation, the young adults of our world are more fearful than any generation has been in a long time because of all the threats on the map. Whether you want to talk about uh, China and maybe they're going to take over Taiwan and you have Russia and you have, you have um, what's happening in the Middle East that, that could engulf us. And, and all these threats around peace has always been elusive for this world and its humans because of sin. But God will bring peace. And his kingdom will be all-encompassing. It says, and of his government and peace there will be no end. And then this is telling. He will sit on David's throne. It says, on the throne of his father David, he will sit and rule over his kingdom to order it and establish it with two words, judgment and justice. They go together. You have to judge evil to bring justice. You have to, to judge evil to move forward with, with justice. And so, so um, God is going to do all that. And look what it says. It says, the zeal of the Lord of hosts, the zeal of the Lord of hosts will, will, will bring this to pass. And I think we need to, to realize this, that, that his coming will be a supernatural act of God. That, that it will be a supernatural act of God. Does, does the birth of Jesus as described in Matthew chapter 1 and Luke chapter 2, do they check those marks? As we look at, at Matthew 1 and we look at Luke chapter 2, was Jesus' arrival supernatural? Was he seen as a ruler of the throne of David? Um, and, uh, and, and was he born a son to a woman? And indeed, born to a virgin, and that was well described for us in the, the Matthew passage that she had said by her own testimony, how can I give birth to a son? I have not known a man. And God's answer was, the Holy Spirit will come upon you. But there's something that hasn't, been, that hasn't happened yet. We haven't seen him sit on David's throne. He is been foretold to do that, and all of nation of Israel expect him to do that, but he didn't do it when he was here the first time. He's going to do it when he comes back again, and he will sit on David's throne, and he will bring justice to the world, and he will bring peace, as this is described in, in Revelation in the, in the Millennial Kingdom and also in the Old Testament prophets. But I want to ask you this, where is, is your trust this morning? Where is your trust for, let's, let's ask that for a couple of things. First of all, where's your trust for the next life? Is it in your good works? Is it in a belief that maybe annihilation is what happens to everybody that dies and they just cease to exist? Or do you think you'll get to heaven and because you went to the right church, you'll get to heaven? Or because you, um, you, know, you, did, you were better than most people or you, you, your good works outweighed your bad works, you'll get to heaven? Or, or what? Where's your trust for that? But, then, but let me ask you, where is your trust for everyday life? Like, like your trust for how... Um, this, this big problem is going to be solved in your life or how your family will turn out or that, that the concern you have for your children or your health or your finances or your career, your job, your relational difficulties. Where's your trust? Where do you look to find solutions to the everyday problems that you experience? Is it in your own wisdom some people are pretty smart. They can solve a lot of problems. But there's always going to be problems that are out of your control, no matter how smart you are. Is it your connections? Is it who you know? You know, the old saying is not what you know, it's who you know. And you have good connections. 
And you have a lot of trust in them to work things out for you. It was just an election. Some people were very happy. Some people are very upset. Those who had trust in a leader that didn't get elected are scrambling and are feeling crushed. Those who had trust in a leader that did get elected, how do you know? He may solve some problems, but can he solve all problems? Some are worried he'll make a lot more. How do you know what a leader will do? A lot of people probably trusted Ahaz, and look what happened there. Is our trust in our leaders, is it in our connections, is it in our own wisdom? It needs to be in God. Our trust needs to be in God. And that is where the Israelites of Isaiah's day went wrong. The leaders went wrong. Their trust was not in God. Ahaz didn't even want to talk about it. He had a plan. And he wasn't going to let some prophet that he never liked anyway to divert him from his plan. Even if he supposedly brought a message from God. You know, you don't need a prophet to bring you a message from God. You have his word. Do you trust it? And then the question is, if you say you trust it, do you really read it enough to know what it says? To be honest in your assessment that you trust it? Or if you don't trust it, have you read it enough to really evaluate that statement, that belief? Our trust needs to be in God. In times of difficulty, in times of disappointment, you know, God allows those to happen many times just to rattle our trust when it's in the wrong things and it's in the wrong places. Let's not learn the hard way, the way that the nation of Israel had to more than once, but especially in the days of Isaiah, to trust other things besides God. One of the things we have to remember when trusting God is his timeline. His timeline can be frustratingly prolonged sometimes. I hate waiting, and many times God makes us wait. But we have to trust him. Just because somebody delivers the quickest doesn't mean they deliver the best. And what we can get immediately is often inferior to what takes time. And so we have to trust God in times of disappointment, in times of difficulty, in times of waiting. We need to keep our eyes on our Savior. We need to keep reading his word. You can read a passage that you know very well. You can read it over and over every day. And God will show you something new if, our, if your eyes are open. And I don't think anybody has memorized all 66 books of the Bible. So we need to keep reading it. Even if some of what we read is something we've heard before. In fact, often, some of the most rewarding times of reading God's word is when I've reread something I've known for a long time but really never looked at it thoughtfully. Never stop to consider how does that speak to the situation I'm living in right now? How powerful is God's truth here that I just took for granted and I, it was just common words to me and now I'm stopping and thinking about it and saying that's exactly what I need for today. But it's also rewarding when you read something new. And um, look to God, read his word, talk to him in prayer and truly trust him with your life, and with your eternity. Dear God, help us to learn from the mistakes of the past, whether it's the near past, maybe it's our history and things we've done, our parents' history, our grandparents' history, or maybe it's going back into ancient times like the book of Isaiah. Lord, help us to learn to trust you and learn not to lean on our own understanding but in all our ways acknowledge you. I pray we would build habits into our lives that help us do that, especially as we enter into this very busy season that is really meant
to cause us to focus on you. I pray it does that, and I pray we celebrate the truth of Christmas and celebrate it well for all the right reasons. In Jesus' name, amen. I stand and sing in closing doubt as